morning. Yeah. We're in uh, Matthew chapter 22 this morning. Matthew chapter 22. And uh, I don't think I got any announcements. Matthew 22. And we are going to finish up the parable here. Uh, last week, I think I took in a... Some folks, I think I went a little bit unclear with. And uh, so, I'll, the week before, I tried showing when the marriage supper of the Lamb will be. Here in uh, the beginning of the millennium. And uh, last week, the lesson was mainly just to show you different groups throughout the ages that will reappear during the millennium that are just groups that's there. What I was not trying to do last week was uh, say that, uh, teach a trib rapture or point anything toward a trib rapture. I think that confusing confusion came across to some people. Those are just groups of people that are saved in different time periods and their dispensation that will appear in the millennium as saints in the millennium. The marriage supper of the Lamb doesn't have anything to do with the trip rapture. It has to do with the folks that are coming into the millennium and the beginning of the millennium. That's what the marriage supper of the Lamb has to do with. Uh, the tribulation rapture is somewhere back in here, and anybody that's raptured in the tribulation will come back at the second coming and go through, go into the marriage supper. So it's two different events. It's two different events. I just want to make that clear. It's, it's not the same thing. It's two different events, two different teachings or time periods to, or things to teach. You just teach them separate. Uh, the trip rapture will happen earlier. You know the 144,000 are raptured in the tribulation and there's a possibility there will be another rapture of some of the saints, a partial rapture of the saints in the tribulation right before the seals the, or the seven vials, not seals, seven vials right at the end of the tribulation. So uh, there's a possibility of a two-part rapture in the tribulation. And that's, a tribu and that's a totally different teaching than the marriage supper of the Lamb. Marriage supper of the Lamb comes later at the beginning of the millennium. Alright. So I just want to try to clarify that. And that's why I showed you the marriage supper in Luke is at when he returns from the wedding... So it's after the return of Christ at the second coming. So the marriage supper is, the trib rapture will be before the return of Christ. The marriage supper will be after the return of Christ. Alright, just to make that clear. I know we get into some stuff that's a little hard to understand. And this stuff can be a little bit difficult. I understand that. Uh, not all of it is actually even clear to me sometimes. And when I got into that stuff last week, four of those points I'm 100% sure on. Three of the points I'm like, well, I don't know exactly. I'm kind of guessing here. <laughs> so uh, so uh, I give you what I know, and that's about as far as I can go with it. All right, Matthew chapter 22 uh, before we get started here, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And I want to finish up this marriage supper of the Lamb, or at least this parable here in Matthew 22. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I pray that you'll take and uh, be with the services this morning. I pray that you'll bless them. I pray that, uh, if anything else, we'll get a desire and a hunger to see that there's things in your Word that we can study and learn more and more from you. Now I pray that we'll take your word as being something important, that we'll have a desire to learn it and to study it and to understand it as best as we can with the abilities that you give us. 
In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, Matthew chapter 22 and verse 1. The Bible says, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables, and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my ox and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready, come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their way, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. Now those that made light of it would be uh, Israel at the time of Christ, where the kingdom of heaven is being presented to them, and they reject it. They don't accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah. They reject Him. They say, away with Him. And they say, crucify Him. So they make light of it. And the remnant took His servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth and sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. I would make verse 7, 80, 70 where Israel is punished for crucifying their Messiah and rejecting the preaching of the disciples and the apostles at the beginning of the book of Acts and having them killed also, and Stephen stoned. All right, verse 8, Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. Now here's uh, up till verse uh, 9 and 10, you could make that everybody getting saved in the church age because obviously they go to the wedding, right? All right, we're the bride, we're at the wedding. But we run into a problem at verse 11. And when the king came in to see the guest, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how, canst, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to his servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him, and cast him into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So because this fella that shows up doesn't have the right garments on, he's cast into a lake of fire. He's thrown into hell. And that's clearly what it's saying there. All right. First of all, how did he get there? Well, you go back, it's the feast that's being ready. So that's why the importance of knowing when the marriage supper is. It's after the wedding in the millennium. Okay, the wedding of the bride happened up in heaven already at the judgment seat of Christ. So it was before he comes back. So this particular gentleman that's being discussed here that goes to the lake of fire is somebody at the marriage supper. Well, that's still on earth. All right, there's a way he could have got there on earth because the marriage supper is on earth right before the millennium. It's not up in heaven. Uh, everybody follow that. Yes? Yeah. Follow no, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I can tell by your face you didn't follow me there. <laughs> I'm trying to make it simple here uh, as best as I can. The millennium is a thousand year reign on this earth. So after the Lord comes back, He sets up His millennial kingdom. He has a judgment of the nations that are left after the battle of Armageddon. Because the only ones at the battle of Armageddon are the soldiers that gather together to fight against the Lord. 
and he's going to wipe them out, and there's going to be blood up to a horse's bridle. But that will not be the whole population of the earth. There will still be people alive on earth after the battle of Armageddon. Those people are the nations that will be judged to be allowed to enter into the millennial reign. When they're judged, that's the judgment of nations, and then they're allowed to partake of the marriage supper, which is a figurative of the beginning of the millennium. Okay, that's the marriage supper going into the millennium. All right, so here's a fellow that shows up that doesn't have a wedding garment. That is, and then cast in a lake of fire. That is going to be a match of the judgment of nations. Somebody that shows up to go into the millennium, but because he has not got a wedding garment, he's not allowed into the millennium. And he's cast into a lake of fire. Now, who is this gentleman? Well, let's go to Revelation and see how somebody at the end of the tribulation has to have garments of righteousness to be saved at the end of the tribulation. All right, take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 3. Now understand in Revelation what's being taught for the tribulation saint to be saved, he has to endure to the end, he, have to ha he has to have faith in Christ, and he has to have works. He has to have righteousness. The tribulation saint is not saved like we are by faith through grace with no works. We're, now you got to understand, we're saved by grace through faith. There's no works involved at all. But that's not the case with the tribulation saint. He is put under the law of Moses. He is put under a certain amount of works. Alright? Now it's not 100% the law, but as far as the commandments go, he's put under a certain amount of works. Let's look at, take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 5. And this is where everybody gets confused because what they'll do is they'll see that the tribulation saint is under works, and then they try to take those verses aimed at the tribulation saint and put them on Christian today, and that's why you have so many people that think you can lose your salvation if you're not righteous enough. That's what they think. So if you talk to somebody, they'll say, well, your salvation is granted at the end of your life, endure to the end, if you, you're saved as soon as you call upon the Lord, but you have to prove your salvation to the end of your life, then your eternal life is actually granted to you. That's the way they'll describe it to you, which is false. Now that matches better with tribulation doctrine. Because in tribulation doctrine, that's actually the way it is. But see, what they're trying to do is they're trying to take tribulation doctrine and apply it to you. Now turn to Revelation chapter 3. So he didn't have a wedding garment. He didn't have his wedding garment on. Uh, Revelation chapter 3 and look at verse 5. Let's look at this garment. He that overcometh, he overcame the tribulation. The same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. All right, so what's given to him? A white robe. He's given a white robe. Why? Because he overcame. Now, look at, uh, look at Revelation chapter 18. Revelation chapter 18. Pick up verse 22. Revelation chapter 18. Pick up verse 22. And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and trumpets shall be heard no more at all in thee, and no craftsman of what... Uh, hang on a second. Do I got the right verse here? Revelation... Oh, I wrote down the verses, but 18 through 22, but I didn't write down the chapter. I think that's Revelation 3 is where I'm supposed to be. I apologize. Sometimes I don't... 
my hand does not... Yes. Sorry. Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. I hate it when I turn to a verse and start reading it to y'all and it has nothing to do with what I'm teaching. I'm like, wait a second. (laughs) This don't make sense. (laughs) Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. Now I'm on the right track. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and what? White raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyes salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. All right, verse 21, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me and my throne, even as I also overcame, and I sat down with my father in his throne. So the church of Laodicea is also told to take and get white raiments. To get white raiments. Now look at, uh, take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, pick up verse 11. And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Uh, Let's go back up and get verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. So what this is, is it's the saints that are killed in the tribulation. And they're given white robes. In other words, that's one that was faithful unto death in the tribulation. He was faithful unto death. And because he was faithful unto death, the Lord grants them the white robes. Alright, so they'll show up, they'll come back with the Lord at the second coming, and they'll have white robes at the beginning of the tribulation. Alright? The uh, ones in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, they have to earn their white robes. Now uh, look at... uh, Look at Revelation 7, chapter 7, pick up verse 13. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came, what? Out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So it's somebody in the tribulation that's put their trust in Jesus Christ. That's who they are. And uh, they've made their robes white. And uh, I want the other one where it says uh, that the robes are the, the righteousness of the saints. That one, I think, is in Revelation... I didn't write that one down. I can't believe I didn't write that down. Revelation 19, I think. Or it's toward the end here. Uh, It's either 19 or... Here it is. 19a. Revelation 19a. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is what? The righteousness of the saints. So what is fine linen? It's righteousness. What's the white robes? It's righteousness. It's that they're clothed in righteousness. So at the beginning of the millennium, they're going to be judged according to what? Whether or not they have faith in Christ and their righteousness. Their righteousness. That's the way they'll be clothed. And that's going to match... Matthew chapter 25, verses uh, 
31 through 46, which I read to you two weeks ago, remember, on the judgment of nations. And we'll take and get into that a little bit more on the judgment of nations. Matter of fact, Matthew 25 will be on the judgment of nations the whole chapter. The whole chapter we're going to be on the judgment of nations. The judgment of nations is at the beginning of the millennium determining who's going to be allowed to go into the millennium. Huh? What's that? It'll be right there between the second coming and the tribute and the millennium. I just make it the beginning of the millennium is the way I put it. Because there now exactly how many days in after the because uh, you get into Daniel the, and the Old Testament prophets, there's a certain amount of time that's granted for cleaning up after the Battle of Armageddon, cleaning the land up, sanctifying the land, and then there's a certain amount of numbers of days at the end of the book of Daniel that kind of hard to figure out. It's going to be right in there. So it will be at the beginning of the millennium. Then what you'll have in the millennium is the ones that are allowed in, they're not exactly what you would call uh, have eternal security. They're just allowed into the millennium. Uh, well, what you got to understand is at the rapture of the church, everything changes as far as the way a man saved. For a guy in the tribulation, it's sealed if he dies for Christ. Then he has eternal life, okay? He's, he's done everything he needs to do. But let's take this guy that goes from the tribulation, okay? He's not so bad that God's going to cast him into hell. He took care of the Jews. He ministered to them. But he's still a human mortal being. He's mortal, okay? He's still going to die. He goes into the millennium. He's still mortal. He doesn't have eternal life. But his righteousness, he puts faith in Christ. He accepts Christ when he comes back. He didn't take the mark of the beast. He endured to the end. He overcome. He comes into the millennium, but he's still a human being that can have children. And they have children for a thousand years in the millennium. The earth goes on. They're repopulating in the millennium. God's ruling, we're ruling over the earth, and people just go right on through. But sin nature isn't done away with. So there's still people in the millennium that has sin nature. And unless they serve God in the millennium, they'll die and go to hell. It's not a matter of putting their faith in Christ. Why? Why is faith not a big deal in the millennium? They're living by sight. It's almost the opposite of what you are right now. You're by faith without works. They're with works without faith. Almost the opposite. It's a dictator that's reigning with a rod of iron. In our words, he te when he says jump, you jump. <laughs> he says sit, you sit. You do what he tells you to do. And who's enforcing that? Well, all the ones that rule with Him. That's where you come into play. You'll reign with Him in the millennium. You're a ruler in the millennium. You're enforcing the service of the King and the worship of the King. Now, toward the end you say, well, He makes it where the plowman takes over the reaper and everything's great, the curse is partially lifted, and everything's great in the millennium as long as they're serving God. He's giving them rain, and the harvest, I mean, people are just, I mean, as we say in the South, they're high on the hog and low on the chicken. I mean, they're, they're living good. Why would they rebel against that? They do, at the end. That's why you have the battle. How could you have the battle of Gog and Magog if sin nature was done away with? It's not done away with. So you still have sin nature through the millennium. And this guy here is saved 
by works obeying the king. That's why you got to divide your Bible because, all right, here's, here's when it comes to salvation, this is why I've told you through all ages, if we want to make things common, what's the common stuff? Grace, what's grace? Mercy given that's not deserved. Everybody's a sinner all the way from Adam through the end of the millennium. Until he's given a new mind like Christ, he's a sinner. So God has grace with him. There's a certain amount of grace even in the millennium. They're not going to be perfect, obviously. They're, they have a sin nature. You couldn't be perfect either. You go into the millennium and you know all this stuff, you, you ain't going to wind up being perfect. So there's got to be a certain amount of atonement and grace given in the millennium. But they can go to Jerusalem. They see God, Jesus Christ, on the throne. They don't have to believe on Him. They can look right on Him. They can see Him. They can see all this stuff going on in the millennium. They can see Him controlling the weather. They know He's God. Okay? That part, the faith part's done away. You don't... Huh? Now it's by works in the millennium. So it's not the same as what it is here. Right now, we don't see anything. We just take it by faith. Now, you see God's hand because you know it's God's hand through weather and through creation and all that. It declares His handiwork, yes. But you don't see God. He doesn't talk to you with an audible voice. It's a still, small voice in your heart speaking to you. It's you reading the Word of God and believing what it says. It's faith. It's by faith. In the Old Testament, there was an element of works under the law, and faith wasn't a big emphasis. You say, how do you know faith wasn't a big emphasis? Now, faith was there, but wasn't a big emphasis. You know how I know that? Look up the word faith in the Old Testament. You'll only find it two times. From Genesis to Malachi, you only find the word faith two times. Yet in the New Testament, you'll find it over a hundred times. It starts popping up everywhere. <laughs> okay? Why? Because the emphasis changed. So, what's the second thing in common? Well, faith isn't the thing in common. What's the second thing in common? second thing in common is obeying what God told you to do. So what does uh, Adam and Eve have to do to have eternal life? They've got to obey what God told them to do. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What does uh, Abel and Cain have to do? They have to obey God. Offer the sacrifice that is accepted by God. Cain didn't uh, offer the sacrifice accepted by God. Abel did. Abel's was accepted. Cain's wasn't. So what was Cain do? If thou doest well, knowing Cain knew what to do, he just wasn't willing to do it. If thou doest well, all right, how was Noah saved and the eight souls? He built a boat and got on it. Why? Because God told him to. Are you saved by building a boat and getting on it? No. <laughs> so your salvation isn't like Noah's, is it? It's not the same. So salvation is what? All right, what did Abraham do? By faith, right? By faith, and then James says, no, by works. But what did he actually do? He believed God and he obeyed him. That's what he did. He believed God and he obeyed him. That's what he actually does. Now, both Paul and James use them as an illustration. One of them is on him believing God. The other one is on him obeying God. <laughs> James is on him obeying God. Paul uses them on believing God. One goes to Genesis 15. The other one goes to Genesis 22. Many years in between the two. All right? They're, two talk, they're talking about two different things. What does a church-age saint have to do? Well, he has grace given to him, but what does he have to do? He has to obey what God told him to do. 
Now what did God tell you to do? Believe on the Put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in Him and on His shed work. And don't trust in your own righteousness. Isn't that what He told you? Alright? So for you to be saved, you have to obey what He told you to do. What's He going to tell the tribulation saints? Tell them, do not take the mark of the beast. Believe on My Son. Faith in Christ. Endure to the end and treat your fellow man correctly. There's your works. In other words, they're supposed to take care of them Jews. That's the book of James. And that's why James' is emphasis is on faith and works. Now you read the book of James, the emphasis is on, on faith and works. That's what it's on. Alright? Now you get into the millennium. What is the emphasis on? Obeying the king. Obeying the king. So there's your emphasis. Now do you see how obedience goes all through the Bible, but what you're told to do is what changes. What you're told to do changes. And when you go through the Bible and you find something that the tribulation saint was told to do, and you try to put it on the church age saint, what do you have? Well, you have false doctrine. That's why it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman rightly dividing the word of truth. Alright? So, anyways, that's uh, going back into uh, dispensations. But... Uh, now you say, well, does any of this stuff back here even apply to us? No, not really, it doesn't. You say, well, then why do I have to spend so much time studying? So you won't be deceived by somebody that's taking a verse out of this context and trying to put it on you. That's why you should study it. What's uh, the most important? Well, it's most important that you do have doctrine down for you right now. And most your Baptists will have that. They know you're saved by grace through faith without works and all that stuff. But what most Baptists will do is they're going to, they get those fundamental faiths down, and we call them the fundamentals of the faith. And then they'll try to change the whole Bible to match them fundamentals. Well, that's where we make the mistake as Baptists. When we try to change the whole Bible to match just the church age. And uh, you, if you want to point, spot somebody that's doing that, this is the way you do it. They will make this statement. Well, the Old Testament saint was looking forward to the cross, and the New Testament saint looks back to the cross. And they're all saved by looking to the cross. Well, that's a guy that doesn't understand dispensations, putting everybody saved exactly like the New Testament is. That's a... I mean, it'll get you saved, I guess, but it's, it's a not understanding everything in the Bible. So that's why we're trying to understand it all, all of this stuff. Now, i got to finish up this parable here. All right, so uh, back to Matthew twenty-two twelve, And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servant, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. And you have to put that with Matthew 25. It's the only way that thing works. Otherwise, you got somebody in heaven without a wedding garment and you're casting them out. The only other time you see anything close to that is in John, where it talks about somebody trying to come up another way on the ladder, which Jesus is saying, I am the door, and anybody tries to come up as a thief and a robber. And that thing there, I would make it a spiritual application, not a literal one, where somebody is trying to get to heaven the wrong way. That's the closest you ever come to matching what you're seeing here. All right. Or at least that's the closest I've ever found. Maybe there's another one I don't know about. Uh, so let's... Uh, 
Pick up now with Matthew 22:15. We got a few minutes. We'll get started on this next section of the chapter. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they m- might entangle him in his talk. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true and teachest the way of God in truth. Now they didn't believe that for a minute. But uh, they're trying to entangle him. This is a trickster. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Now what they're figuring is no matter which way Jesus Christ goes, they'll have him cornered. If he says, no, it's not lawful, they can run to Caesar and say, hey, this Jesus of Nazareth is teaching people not to pay their taxes. You better get on to him. If he says, yes, it's lawful, then they're going to take and run to Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17. And the law tells you not to give pay tribute to somebody that's not a Jew. Deuteronomy chapter 17, pick up verse 14. When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell in there, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me, Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. But he shall multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end. They should multiply horses, for as much as the Lord hath said unto him, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Alright? So you have there, they're commanded not to set a king over them that's not of their brethren. Now, was Caesar of their brethren? No. No. So these, I mean, you got to understand, their whole purpose is to catch Jesus in their words. They're going to trick Jesus. They're going to fool him. They're going to mess him up in his words. So they decide to pick a question that he cannot answer correctly as far as they're concerned. Either way he goes, they're going to have an argument against him. Now, they didn't know who they were messing with. <laughs> All right. Now look what the uh, Lord says to him. Tell us, therefore, what saint thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? He sees right through it. He knows exactly what they're doing. Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny. And he said to them, Whose is the image and subscription? They say unto him, Caesar. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. In other words, he says, well, the money that Caesar's asking for isn't important because it's his anyways. Just give it back to him if he wants it. Oh, <laughs> I mean, that's kind of hard to argue with. In other words, they're not expecting that answer. They're not expecting that answer. And the only way that answer would be a problem with them is if they said that they wanted Caesar's money. Well, if it's Caesar's money, it didn't belong to them anyway. So now it's turned back on them, and there's no way they can answer that one and look good. Okay? Now, there's another part of this teaching that you want to get, and that is that when the, the reality is that Israel, by God, was turned over to the Gentiles for the Gentiles to rule over them because of their sin. And things has changed about what God's allowing them and telling them to do concerning Gentile kings. 
Because the commandment in Deuteronomy was given to them while they were serving God. And the condition they're at right now is God's already turned them over to the Gentiles and said because of your wickedness, the Gentiles will reign over you and you are to obey the ones that are put over you. And uh, you want to study the book of Daniel to see that the Jews worse and Jeremiah, they were commanded to subject themselves under the Gentile king. So uh, when it comes down to it, yes, they were supposed to pay their taxes to Caesar. And that would not have been... Yes, it's uh, breaking the Deuteronomy commandment, but the Deuteronomy commandment was annulled when they were sold under, under the Gentiles as far as serving a king only of their brethren. And uh, because they decide to rebel against that commandment is why they're destroyed in A.D. 70. You realize A.D. 70 was brought about because the Jews rebelled against Caesar. And uh, these, you got to understand, these Jews do not enjoy being under Caesar right now. And they're just using Caesar because they'd rather be under Caesar than under Christ, so they're using Caesar to get rid of Christ. All right, look, at, look how they'll choose Caesar over Christ. Um, look at John chapter 19. John chapter 19. John chapter 19. Look at verse 15. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. In other words, when it came to Caesar or Christ, they'd rather Caesar. They don't want to be under Caesar. They think it's wrong to serve under Caesar. And they want to rebel against them, but when it comes to the two, a choice between the two, they're going to pick Caesar instead of Christ. And uh, so the whole question is just to get rid of Christ. They're just trying to trick Christ and get rid of him. Now uh, next week, I'm going to take and get into Jesus paying his taxes and uh, why we are to subject ourselves under taxes. So, if you want to skip next week, you've already been warned where I'm going into. <laughs> I just had to pay my taxes last, uh, yesterday. Uh, just Obama got me for thirteen hundred. Uh, like, yeah. Never mind. I ain't even gonna go into that. I'm gonna fall from grace if I go into that one. <laughs> but. Uh, they got Obamacare came through, and if you don't have insurance, you get penalized. So that thing was not done away with until 2019. So I got my penalization yesterday. They smacked my hand and said, bad boy. <laughs> All right. All right, let's, uh, let's uh, break. So I'll have fun next week teaching on taxes. <laughs> but, uh, let's take a break.